Amen. Well, good morning again. Welcome to New Life. If you're visiting with us and worshiping with us for the first time, uh, we are in the middle of a series in the book of 1 Peter entitled Between Two Worlds Living in an Exile. And so today we come to the third chapter, and we're continuing along. And so if you have your Bibles, please open up with me to 1 1 Peter chapter 3. Our scripture reading this morning comes to us in verses 8 to 18. And so if you have your Bibles, open up to that passage. If not, can we all stand? And then you can read from the screen. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 18. Please give your undivided attention to the reading of God's holy word, starting with verse 8. <clears throat> Finally, all of you having unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil." For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. This is a reading of the word. Please take your seats. So we've been looking at the book of 1 Peter, between two worlds, living in exile. And so far, what Peter, the apostle, has essentially been doing for us, as we've looked and studied at this wonderful letter, is that he's writing to a bunch of Christians who've been scattered out and kicked out of their home, living in a foreign land, and you can imagine their circumstances. It's a high-pressure environment. They're wondering, what's the purpose of holding on to Jesus? They're suffering economic, social, political persecution. It's beginning to grow, intensify. And so Peter's writing to their context and saying, let me give you the resources in order for you to be faithful and to suffer well in the midst of suffering and difficulty in your lives. That's essentially what Peter's saying. And the way he does this more specifically is that he's saying, I'm going to give you a new identity. I'm going to revolutionize, I'm going to give you an identity and say that you are not of this world, but actually, according to chapter 1, you've been born again through the living hope of the resurrection of Jesus. You have a new birth. And not only that individually, but now collectively you've been brought into a spiritual house to be the living temple of God as you are made into living stones centered around the fortress and the foundation of Jesus, who's the cornerstone. So he gives them a new identity on who they are. He's saying it's not about your looks, your accomplishments, it's not about your career success. You're ultimately united to Jesus, and that's the foundation that could fulfill your hearts and never be taken away. And so in our passage here today, he begins to flesh this identity out more. Now, he's been doing it since the end of chapter 1 and beginning of chapter 2, but he begins to flow and to follow and to fill this out even more so, more so for us here this morning. And essentially what we have in verse 8 and 18, 2 18, is that he brings and summarizes and he gathers all his thoughts together. He's saying, yes, new birth in Jesus, new identity, living stone, the priesthood of all believers. You know, he brings this to all into summary fashion, he gathers all his thoughts, and he comes to sort of his conclusion. That's why verse 8 begins with the word, finally. Not the end of the letter, but the end of his thought for this particular section. And his logic is essentially this, that the Christian community, the church here, should be an alternate society when compared to the world. That's why you look at these verses and he quotes from the Old Testament. It says, we don't pay evil for evil, reviling for reviling, but actually we bless. We watch our speech because the Christian community is an alternate society, one characterized by grace, truth, love, mercy, the very gospel himself. And what he's trying to tell us here is that in this alternate society, as the people of God, the way that you can suffer well and the way that you can evangelize and share the gospel with the non-believers is through living out this community that he gives to us as described in verse 8. So in other words, this alternate society, this new reality that has been made possible in Jesus, allows you to suffer well in the midst of pressure and sin and persecution, but also allows you to be more effective in your evangelism. So it has sort of a twofold focus. In other words, friends, this is what Peter is essentially saying. 
The power of our testimony externally is completely and utterly dependent upon the character of our lives internally. In other words, the power of our evangelism is directly correlated and dependent upon the character of our lives internally. So if internally our lives and community, as we confess in the Apostles' Creed, the communion of saints is not strong and loving and gracious, then that will filter in into ineffectiveness in our evangelism externally. Very simple. And so, therefore, we look at this, and Peter brings us all together in his final thoughts, and so I have three considerations to look at here this morning about this idea of this sort of blessing, of inside-out blessing, to be a blessing internally, but also a blessing outside, externally to the non-believing world. So three considerations. First, what Peter's telling us is that we need to be a blessing, and we'll look at what he means by that. Secondly, we always need to be ready. And then third, we need the power to do it. So three points. So we need to be a blessing. Uh, Secondly, we also need to be ready with an answer, and then third, we need the power to do it. And so, so you could sort of track and follow along what we're doing here. About 60%, 65% of our time will be on point one. What does it mean to be a blessing? How do we parse that out? How do we apply this? And then about 20%, point two, 20% will end on point three. So that's where we're sort of headed. So we need to be a blessing, we need to be ready, and then we need to have the power in order to live this out. And so that's what Peter gives us here this morning. So let's look at point one. We need to be a blessing. And I take this clearly from verse nine. If you read with me verse 9, this is what it says. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, no, very emphatic, on the contrary, bless. No, very simple. On the contrary, bless. For to this you are called. No, you're, you're supposed to bless, for to this you've been called. So very clear. Peter's, you know, he's very simple in this way, that you maintain a blessing. So don't pay evil for evil, reviling for reviling, this endless cycle of revenge, but bless, because to this you've been called. In other words, friends, our mission to the world is simply to be a blessing to one another and also to the world out there. Now, what's a blessing? What does it mean to bless? Well, it's interesting because we actually sang that in one of the songs. But blessing or to bless is one of those words that we could actually ask God to do to us, but it's also something that we do to God. No, we bless the Lord, but we also ask the Lord to bless our soul. So the word there literally actually is the word where we get eulogy. You know, as we go to funerals and we commemorate and celebrate the lives of people who have gone past this world, eulogy. And that word eulogy is a, a speech or a piece of writing that celebrates, that praises someone's life who you have been blessed by. You know, someone typically who passed away. Eulogy, bless. In other words, this is what we're called to do. To eulogize the world. To eulogize one another. But he sort of makes this a little bit gospel-centered. It's not just for people to pass away, but he says we bless people with our words and our lives, but we also more gospel-centeredly ask for God's grace to saturate and cover the people here. That's what it means to bless. It's a very deep and significant but sort of general word that we eulogize the world, that we eulogize one another asking for blessing upon one another and out there in the world. That's what he calls us to do in verse 9, that we need to be a blessing. Now, the question comes, okay, what does that mean, and how do we really do this? And that brings us back to verse 8. And this is where we're going to spend most of our time. Five characteristics, five gospel virtues. He says this is how you could bless people inside the church and begin to evangelize the the people outside the church. So verse 8, this is what it says. Finally, all of you, so not just a couple of people, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. So five characteristics, five gospel virtues, five countercultural virtues and characteristics that seem similar to Greco-Roman culture, but actually in Jesus, these gospel virtues subvert sort of the way the Greco-Roman culture works. Now, let me try to explain this and give some preliminary thoughts about these five virtues. They seem random, don't they? You know, they seem sort of just kind of scattered thoughts that Peter just sort of wrote by himself. But actually, if you look at this, there is some sort of pattern here. Now, the pattern is, is loose, but it, I think it's there. If you look at verse 8 again, this is the pattern. It says there, um, five characteristics. The first and the fifth characteristic deal with the intellect. They're about the mind, isn't it? Now, if you look there, it says, have unity of mind. And then the last one, a humble mind. So it brings the intellect, it brings the cognitive factors, it brings the sort of mental capacity. And then the inner three characteristics, when you look at them, all deal with emotion. You know, there's sympathy, compassion, and love. So there's mind on the outside and then character and compassion and love in the inside. So I think that's very intentional by the Apostle Peter. Now, outer ones are mental and intellectual. The inner ones are about emotional passion and the center of what drives the Christian life, which is love, brotherly love in the center. So this is how it could be a blessing. This is how you eulogize the church in the world. 
that you can cultivate Christian maturity and community by applying and living out these five gospel virtues. The outer one's about the mind, the inner one's about the emotions and the character. Friends, when Peter wrote this, this spoke directly into the culture of Greek philosophy. Well, why? Because in Greek philosophy, essentially is this. The mind and reason is ultimate. You know, you're actually supposed to, implicit in their philosophy, get rid of all emotions. You know, get rid of passions. Those were sort of for the lower class or even dirty, depending upon the philosopher. So mind and reason is how you attain to a higher life. It's all about the intellect. It's all about the, the knowledge and the cognitive abilities of the person. So get rid of the emotions and go for the mind. But Peter subverts that, doesn't he? He says, yes, the mind is important. You have to understand what you believe. You have to think about the world and about God and all creation reality. But you can't separate the mind from emotions. So he says, emotions and heart, feelings, are just as important as the mind and the intellect. You need essentially both. You know, Tom Landry, the former coach of the Dallas Cowboys, once said this, the difference between a good player... And a great player in football is about 12 inches, the distance between the head and the heart. You need both. And that's essentially what Peter's trying to tell us. Now, many of you know the New York, uh, New York Times journalist David Brooks, and so I'm not supporting his politics and whatnot, but I think he's a critical mind, very helpful, food for thought. So in a TED talk that he gave back in 2011, he essentially made the same point that Greek philosophy did. And this is what he essentially said. He was giving a TED talk on his book, The Social Animal. And this is what he's trying to say. That we have today inher inherited a view of humanity that is very much like Greek philosophy. In other words, there's a deep separation between our mind and then our heart. That we think through the mind in some categories, but then we live through the heart in other aspects of life. So he says, we inherited that view of humanity. And so he gives all these studies and all these factual studies of cognitive and behavioral sciences, politics. Now, I'm not sure of how robust his you know, studies are, but I think it's food for thought. So he said, as an example, in the beginning of his journalistic career, he was told to interview three politicians a day, which he did. And he said, these politicians were the most savvy people that he could ever meet and imagine. They were so good at making people feel comfortable and relating to people. But when they went into policymaking, they separated out their heart, and it was all in the mind, because there was a separation from the heart of being savvy with people in the mind and policymaking. And so he observes this, and he says they were sort of dehumanized when they began their policymaking because they needed heart, they needed compassion, they needed conviction and sympathy, they needed not just the mind, but also the emotions. And so he says more and more in our culture, we separated reason from emotion. So he says this, look at the everyday person. We're very good in Western culture about talking about material things, you know, vacations, cars, money, investments, but we're very bad at actually talking about emotions. We're good about talking about skills and safety and health, but very bad about talking about character. You know, look at any job posting in America, essentially in the corporate world, medical field, law. I think anything out there, when you look at a job posting, it's all about skills, isn't it? It's all about your abilities, your pedigree, your degrees. You never see a job description that says, we're looking for somebody that has a lot of compassion. Now, maybe if you're looking for a position for church or mercy ministry or missions, but the corporate world, the secular world, it's all about skills, never about emotion. But there's a deep separation between our mind, but also our heart and our emotions. You know, David Brooks goes on and he says, there was a study done, and I thought this was interesting, between two groups of men. He says, one group of men were simply to watch a horror movie, and then a second group of men were simply to tell their wives, how much they love them. And so when they traced the brain pattern of these two groups, they were completely identical. In other words, watching a horror movie and telling your wife, I love you, are both like horrifying, <laughs> really difficult to do. The brain patterns were essentially the same. And he's saying, well, don't put all your eggs in that basket, but it's kind of interesting, isn't it, that we're not really good, we're uncomfortable telling and expressing our emotions. You know, Alistair McIntyre, a philosopher, said this once, we have today the concepts of ancient morality, such as virtue, honor, goodness, but actually, we have no system to connect these virtues to our everyday lives and thinking. His conclusion, David Brooks was, is essentially this, that we, have that we have a better understanding of humans today, and so that we have to incorporate both mind and heart. Because when you have a separation of mind and heart, you essentially have human endeavors and society that is ineffective. 
That's why, I don't know if I agree with this, but he says, when you separate the mind and the heart, you have ineffective humanity, whether in politics, whether in foreign relationships, whether in the economy. So actually, if we have a better understanding of humanity, that's not just a separation of heart and mind, but actually combines them together in this very wonderful, intricate reality of humanity, that's the way forward in order to be effective in the world, even for non-believers. So he says, actually, we need to live this out and understand and incorporate our emotions and our hearts. And he cites a couple of studies. He says, babies, when they connect with their mothers, they come up with a study that said they can identify 77% of the babies that will graduate from high school because they have an emotional connection with their mom. Now, correlation and causation are different, so I don't know, but I think at least it's food for thought. Something to consider because he speaks into our culture, and this is our culture, and this is how we think about it. So I agree with a lot of what he says, or at least I think it's food for thought, but I think that if we could take his point that you combine mind and heart, then that's the way forward. And the reason I take David Brooks's point is because essentially that's verse 8. He takes the outer characteristics and takes the inner three, and it's mind and heart. It's intellect, also it's emotion. You see? That's what he's saying. Do you, do you see what I'm getting from this? Verse 8, according to Ed Clowney, said this, like fingers of a hand, the five virtues of verse 8 radiate from the center and work together. That's how they ought to work. They reflect the very love of Jesus. So Peter's essentially saying, you want to be a blessing, you want to eulogize the world, you want to eulogize the church and out there, then you need to live out and apply these five gospel virtues. They reflect the love of Christ. You need a passionate reason, and you need a reason that's fueled by passion. You need a heart as well as a head. You need your head that's fueled by your heart and a heart that is informed by your head. And that is what Peter is essentially telling us. Okay, now let's look through these characteristics briefly, quickly. Remember, 60% of the time in point one, but I want to take some time quickly to run through these characteristics. And you apply this to your life. Say, is this me? Am I going to be eulogizing? Am I going to be a blessing? Well, look at these characteristics, both head as well as heart. You know, some, are, some of us are more cognitive, we're thinkers. Other, others of us are more emotional. So you need to find a balance. You, know, you can't live your life just through rational, you know, intellectual thought process and analysis. But you can also just live through your heart. So if you're just living by what you're feeling, then you're imbalanced. But if you're living simply by your mental faculties, you're sort of imbalanced. You need kind of both. Bring the outer and the inner characteristics of verse 8 together. And so this is what it says. Unity of mind. This is what it means. It means agreeable and sensitive to other people's thoughts. Unity of mind. It doesn't mean that you agree on everything. You know, same taste in music and movies, politics. You don't agree on every point, but you have a unity of attitude as well as understanding. So you have a unity of mind. You're, you're willing to listen, to have an understanding. You could be agreeable and agree to disagree. And this unity of mind can only emerge out of relationships, out of deep interconnectivity and common causes. So in other words, think about a choir. Members in a choir all don't sing the same note. That's not unity of the mind. Members of a choir have different parts, right? There's bass, there's alto, there's sopranos. Each person can sing harmony. There's different notes, but they're in harmony towards one another. That's unity of mind. We don't have to agree on everything. But the, our attitude should be of a similar likeness, that we can connect with one another because we'll listen to each other. So we have to have unity in mind. Secondly, I'll bring these two together. If you look at the emotional ones, the second and fourth characteristic, there is sympathy and also what Peter says, tender heart. That word tender heart is actually compassion. So you have to be sympathetic and you have to be compassionate. So you need unity in mind, but also sympathy and compassion. Now let me ask you a question. Are you a sympathetic person? Are you a compassionate person? Well, how do you know? Well, what does it mean? This is what the Bible means by this. Sympathy and compassion, they sort of go together. Sympathy basically means you have the gift of experiencing what somebody else experiences, that you can empathize with their emotions. And compassion means that you just have a love and a tenderness of heart. So that's why they're sort of brought together. But this is the trick. See, many of us, it's easy for us to be sympathetic to when people suffer and go through hard times, right? Somebody loses a job. Somebody has a death in the family. Somebody actually has a lot of strain in their marriage and parenting. You know, somebody actually has some sort of drastic um, emergency. You can sympathize with that because there's misfortune, there's suffering. But in the first century, the word for compassion, as well as the idea of sympathy, doesn't mean that you can just be sorry for when people suffer, but it actually means you rejoice when people are happy. Do you see this? That's how you know you're really sympathetic. See, all of us, most of us can feel a little bit sympathy when somebody goes through something tough, right? But the real key for sympathy and compassion is that not can you just identify with suffering, but you can identify with people when they're doing well. So Romans 12, 15, you rejoice with those who rejoice, but also you mourn when people mourn. 
So the question is, are you empathetic? Are you sympathetic? Are you compassionate? It's not just about feeling sorry for people who go through something tough, but it also means you're happy. You're joyful when something good happens to people. On the flip side, that's how you can gauge, gauge really if you're sympathetic and compassionate. Not just that you're sorry for bad things, but you're happy for good things when it happens to people. That's how you know you're sympathetic and also compassionate. And then moving along, in the center then, we have brotherly love, which basically is a divine love. You know, in the Greek, it's agape love. You know, this unconditional, gracious love, a love that's centered not upon the beauty in the person, but just completely gracious and comes from your heart. So that's the center of all these characteristics. And then the Apostle Peter ends on the humble mind, humility. So this is how you can bring it together. Unity of mind, sympathy and compassion, brotherly love, and then he ends on a humble mind or humility. Now, this is what humility is. I think a lot of us need to learn this lesson. I, I need to learn this lesson. This is what humility is. We've heard this quote many times. C.S. Lewis says this. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. In other words, the opposite of humility is actually pride, isn't it? But the opposite of humility in the heart is being self-absorbed, self-concentrated, you know, self-saturated, that you're just consistently and always thinking about yourself. So think about it in the context of community. See, pride works like this. You walk into a room, and you, there's a sense of self-righteousness, pride, entitlement. Why aren't people serving me? Why aren't people talking to me? You know, I'm the most important person. I'm the most charismatic. I establish myself. So pride walks into a community sort of with entitlement and expectations. You should be talking to me. But then on the flip side, there's a different sort of inverse expression of pride, which comes out in self-loathing or sort of, you know, just being pessimistic about yourself, or low self-esteem. So you kind of come out into a community, and you're like, woe is me. Why isn't anybody reaching out to me? I'm hurting, and I'm suffering. I'm new here. So both of them are sort of expressions of pride, because both are self-concentrated, do you see? Both are self-absorbed. On the one hand, some people are thinking, why isn't anybody talking to me? You know, I'm important, I'm accomplished, I sh I'm, there's entitlement. But on the other side, you're just as self-absorbed, just as self-concentrated, just as prideful inversely because you walk into a community like, whoa, is me, why isn't anybody reaching out to me? Why isn't anybody talking to me? It's essentially the two same heart issues that express itself differently. And Peter's essentially saying, no, you need a humble mind. Humble mind, according to Lewis, is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking about yourself less. In other words, you're not so self-concentrated and self-absorbed, but that you're other-centered. You're not on the one hand, oh, look at me and look at what I'm doing, and you're not on the other hand, woe is me, and I feel so sorry for myself, you're just pitying myself. But actually, when you walk into a community, you're thinking, how can I actually bless someone else? You're other-centered, as Jesus was, that you can reach out to other people. And so Peter brings these together and says, okay, you want to be a blessing, you want to eulogize the world, these are the five characteristics that you have to bring together, unity of mind, sympathy and compassion, brotherly love, and a humble spirit, a humble mind. Not self-absorbed, but other-centered. Not self-concentrated, but thinking about others beside yourself. And this is his point one. This is how you ought to be a blessing. And this leads us into point two. If we have these gospel virtues, if we can live this out, as Ed Clowney said, this will enable us to be ready with an answer. Ready with an answer. Read with me verse 15. Verse 15 says this, no, to a persecuted church, but in your hearts, honor Christ as the Lord as holy, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. So if you live out the verse 8 qualities, then you begin to actually be powerful in your evangelism, in your outreach, in your mercy towards the non-believing community. So in verse 15, he centers on this and says, no matter what, be prepared, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope you have. In other words, be prepared to make a defense. That word defense there is where we get in the Greek the word for apologetics. No, apology. No, you defend the faith. That's essentially what Peter, Peter is essentially saying. So he says, be ready to make a defense for your faith. In other words, you walk into Starbucks, you go to your work, and people say, why do you go to church? Why do you do that? No, why don't, why don't you joke around like the way we joke around? No, why don't you gossip and make fun of your boss like we do? No, why don't you use these certain practices and sales in order to get the bottom line to be a little bit bigger? Why don't you like do, do this? Why don't you do this? You have to be ready at any moment to always give a defense of why your hope is not in this world but in the world to come. Are you guys ready for these conversations? Are you equipped? Are you studying? Do you know Jesus? Well, this is what it says. It's interesting that to be ready, 
to evangelize and to go into sort of an intellectual debate, that's all the mind, isn't it? You know, rational debate, theology, doctrine, you know, sociology, politics, that's all in the realm of the mind. But it's interesting because Peter says, if you want to be ready, the first step is in the heart. That's why he says in verse 15, in your hearts, honor Christ as Lord. In other words, set your heart, Christ, apart wholly and make him the authority in your life in your heart. Isn't that so interesting? Get ready to debate. Use your mind or your theology and doctrine. Be able to evangelize, articulate the gospel. But in order to do this well, set Christ as holy in your heart. It begins in the heart. It's a worship issue. It's a heart issue. See, Bruce Walke, an Old Testament scholar, explained it this way. He says, if you can imagine a plane, an airplane, going through the storms in the sky, then the autopilot, the pilot there, the human pilot, actually puts the plane on autopilot. You know, sophisticated system, um, you know, could navigate the plane through the storms of the air. And so he says, essentially, that analogy is what it means to set Christ as holy in your heart. That through the storms of your life, the control center of your life, which is a heart, is set in tune with the gospel of Jesus because he set him apart as Lord. That's the first way to actually be a good evangelist, to be ready to have an answer. Because Peter is saying the lordship of Christ makes a difference in the way that you think and the way that you live. This is how you begin to prepare to make a defense, an apology, an apologetics. In your hearts, if you revere and fear Jesus, you'll set him apart in your life as Lord over your life. See, isn't it interesting, again, that in evangelism, which is intellectual, theological, rational, Peter says, actually, you've got to set Jesus as the most important person in your heart. Now, as I said before, when you lift up Jesus in your life, the things and thoughts of the world slowly din. And that is what Peter's trying to tell us. The best evangelists, which is all of us, the best worshipers, the best followers of Christ, the best lovers of Christ are those who actually set Jesus apart in their heart as Lord, as holy. You want to be a good evangelist? You got to love Jesus. Very simple, friends. If you don't love Jesus, you're never going to be an effective evangelist. You'll never be ready. If your heart doesn't crave and love the very, Je the very Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you'll never be a good evangelist. Set him apart in your heart as holy, and you'll be on your way to being an effective, good evangelist. And look at what Peter says in verse 15. He says this to everyone, but in your hearts, honor Christ as the Lord. You know what he says in evangelism? If you meet somebody to ask you a question, he doesn't say, give the pastor, give that person your pastor's phone number. No, you don't do evangelism by sort of outsourcing the people that you come across to the specialist. It says you, the people sitting in this room, be ready with an answer to give a defense for the hope that you have in your life. So you have to be honest. You have to be real, friends. Are you ready? Are you ready to have these conversations? Can, can you articulate your faith? Can you share about the gospel of Jesus? Can you work with people and to understand their fears and their, their, their heart issues and be able to speak into their lives with the very gospel of Christ? That, that's what he's trying to say. Are you guys ready? No, last week, many of you know that a couple of us, the elders, Elder Alex and myself, we went to the General Assembly. Um, I'll explain later in the Bible study. I'll do a General Assembly report. Please try to make it out to their really important issues that will affect our church, uh, at least in the long run. Uh, so we went to General Assembly, and so I flew into Mobile, Alabama. First time I've been to Mobile. Actually, a hard place to get to. No one flies to Mobile, Alabama from John Wayne Airport. So the ticket was really expensive. I waited like for 60 days, stayed really expensive. No one goes to Mobile, Alabama. So I fly, fly into the airport. It's a very small airport. I download the Uber app, and I finally got an Uber taxi or whatever you call it in order to drive me from the airport to the hotel. And so it's interesting because I'm talking to the taxi driver. Her name was Diane. Wonderful lady, actually. Very Southern. Um, Caucasian lady, and so she's about 60 years old, is my guess, you know, 55, 60. And so she's very pleasant and easy to talk to. And so I was like, okay, let me try to get to know her as a person. Let me try to evangelize at least. Now I'm here with a thousand different pastors, and I should probably try to evangelize. And she had a tough life. Now she had a tough life. She had a sister that had a tragic accident and passed away. Uh, she has a divorce herself. She has an older daughter. Her mom, who is still alive, is suffering through physical illness, and her dad had passed away through another, another tragic accident. Now, what do you do with this? She gives you the details of this. It's actually really tragic. You know, stories that I've never heard of. Like, how do you do all this? And so I was like, let me see if I could sort of ask her what her hope is. Because she's so calm. She's not erratic. She's calm even through the suffering. So I was like, Diane, how, explain to me, how are you able to be so calm and persevere in life when you went through all this suffering and all this difficulty? And she says, I just try to be a good person. And I was like, what does it mean to be a good person? And she explains what that is, you know, just basic morality. And so I try to weave in the gospel at that point, 
And I said, well, Diana, have you ever gone to church? You know, because I think I'm not as strong as you. If I went through what you went through, I don't think I could be as calm and strong because I think I would need a better hope than thinking I'm a good person because I know I'm not a good person. And then I shared the gospel with her to which she just kind of just put it aside, but at least she was able to hear it. See, the point of what I'm trying to say is this. What I did there in that Uber car is something that all of us are called to do and all of us can do. See, we're not talking about the order salutis. We're not talking about theological treatise of the, you know, the historian order salutis, all these fancy Latin terms that explain theology. That's essential. That's important. You need to study this because it brings life. But what Peter's talking about is those moments in the Uber car. Are you ready to have that conversation? Do you have the compassion? Have you set Jesus apart in your heart so that you would want to share Jesus with the people that come across like Diane? And she didn't accept Jesus, but then actually we kind of became friends. So she was like, well, I'd love to go fishing. So she gave me her card. If you want to go fishing, let me know by five. I'll get the bait and tackle. And I said, I love fishing, even though I don't really like fishing. So maybe I got to get free. But I was like, okay, give me that card. But we didn't have time to do that. But this is the point I'm trying to make. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you prepared to make a defense for the reason of the hope in your life? I pray that you are, because that's what Peter commands us. If you're not, then you need to get ready. And that's what we're trying to do here at church. Now, here at New Life, if you're visiting with us, as I begin to make a close in this message, we have a goal here to cultivate a heart of evangelism. We call it the 2020 goal. It's a five-year goal to evangelize and to get people who are de-churched and non-believers to accept Jesus, whether our church or the surrounding churches. We want to plug them into the church so they could come from the kingdom of the world into the kingdom of Christ. And so we've been trying to do this through preaching and teaching, by modeling it ourselves. We're trying to do this through a seminar that we did on Saturday. I've been doing this with the Young Adult Ministry in a four-week series on evangelism. But eventually, you know, through four years, we want people to set Jesus apart in their hearts so much so that they'll be ready to give a defense for their faith, that they'll have a compassion to share the gospel of Jesus, that they'll have a conviction to share about Jesus so that Jesus will save the sheep who are not of this fold and bring them into this fold. Do you have that heart, friends? I pray that you do. That's what we're working towards. We want to hit that 2020 goal. We want to just reach out to people and love them as people so that they can be brought into this fold. Okay, last but not least, our last point. This is actually only a couple of minutes. Look with me at verse 18. So we need to be a blessing, and <clears throat> we need to be ready, but that's really hard. So how do we do this? Where do we get the power? This is in verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. The power is to set your gaze on Jesus and to look at what he has done for you. See, if your heart is hardened when you read verse 8, like if you read verse 8 and you say, Christ suffered once and for all for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, and make no mistake, we are the unrighteous. That's what he's telling us. We're the unrighteous. If you read this verse and you don't respond, there's no conviction to any degree, your heart is really hardened. It's as simple as that. If the biblical truth of this clarity of the gospel in verse 18, that Jesus suffered once and for all for your sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, and you read this and you think, it doesn't do anything, it doesn't move me to any degree, your heart is hardened. You have not set Jesus apart in your heart, and you need to repent of that. You need to get your heart right so that you set Jesus as Lord of your life and to be holy. Because that's the power of what you can do. I can't give you methodology. I can't give you necessarily strategy. No, we can't give that, but that's not what's going to help you. The best strategy methodology is not going to make you ready to be an evangelist because, as we said in verse 15, you need to set Christ apart from your heart. Well, how do you do this? Verse 18 tells you what Jesus has done for you, what Jesus has given you. New life, he brought you to the Father in the heavenly places. And if you look to him and you gave your life to Christ and you saturate your life with the grace of Jesus and say, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm unrighteous. And that's all of us in this room, but I'm thankful for Jesus who once for all died for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous so that he could get us into heaven. And that's the living hope that we have. If that saturates your heart, if that moves you, then you can be on your way to being ready to evangelize and to be verse 8, to have those gospel characteristics to eulogize the world. Can you do it? Jesus can do that into your heart. He can move you. Let me end with this. Uh, one of the seminars that I attended at the General Assembly was, um, actually, I didn't attend the seminary, but I bought the MP3 because I heard it was good. So I listened to this seminar that was given by a, a, name, by a guy by the name of James Cofield. Now, he's a visiting professor at RTS, a counseling professor. And so, he gave this two-hour seminar. I heard it was good, so I bought it. I listened to it on the MP3, and his, basically he's saying this. It's a counseling seminar, and he's saying these are the people that you need to watch out in church. 
Now, these are the two people that pastors, leaders, you need to watch out for these people in church. I saw, I was like, okay, this is going to be very, uh, I guess, relevant. <laughs> um, when I listened, to, I, I, no one was really like that in this church, so thank, thank God. Um, but he's like, this is how you look at it. So at the end of this seminar, he started sharing about how we can help people along, how we could always be ready, how we could honor Christ and the Lord in our hearts. And he shared about, at the end of this seminar, a story with his son. He has a 28-year-old son who suffers from autism. And he has a mentality and the intellectual capability of an eight-year-old. And so he's talking about when uh, recently he took a four-day cruise in Orlando. And he took his son, 28 years old, you know, he has a mental capacity of about a seven, eight-year-old. And he took his son and he says this, we did everything. I just wanted to spoil him and give him everything that he wanted. So we swam with the dolphins, you know, on the cruise. And he says, my son just really likes yellow food. And so every time we ate, we just always asked for yellow food. And the waiters always just bring all this yellow food out because that's what my son likes. And so he ate all this yellow food. And my son's also just very visual. And so they went to the shops, you know, the scenery, the beaches were good. They try to capitalize on every show because my son's very visual. So he's laughing, he's ecstatic, and he's so happy. And the James Cofield is saying, I wanted to give my son everything that he could to make him happy. But unfortunately, what happened on the last night of the cruise, his son actually accidentally locked himself in the bathroom. And so he started panicking, he started banging on the door, and, you know, James Cofield was trying to calm him down, to talk him down. He didn't know what to do himself, so he eventually called security, and then after a while, the security was able to open the bathroom door. But his son, at that point, was so angry. And then he bursts out of the bathroom, and he raises his fist to his dad and says, you don't do anything for me. You've never done anything for me at all. And James Cofield, now I imagine that's hard to hear as a father. But what he's sharing the story is saying that that's a picture of oftentimes what we do, isn't it? God has given us verse 18. And when life doesn't go our way, according to careers and money and aspirations, vacations, we raise our fist at God and say, God, you haven't done anything for me. God's probably like, oh, I thought I gave you eternal life and salvation, a new birth. I saved you from hell. I got you to me. I guess I didn't do anything. See, if you're like that, you're never going to set Christ apart in your heart. But if you realize that he has given you every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places according to Ephesians 1, and he has given you all the kingdom benefits, and he's given you adoption, he's given you justification, he's given you sanctification, he's given everything that you want beyond your wildest imaginations, the things that the world of this, the things of this world can never satisfy, relationships, marriage, success, will never give you what God has already given you in his kingdom and his son Jesus Christ. If you don't see this, you'll never set Jesus across apart in your heart as Lord. He has given you everything, and then some. So I pray that we look to him and embrace all that the Lord has given us in the resurrection of the living hope of Jesus Christ. Let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you so much that although we oftentimes raise our fists and say, you haven't done anything for us, we thank you, Lord, that we have forgiveness and that we have your word and that we have community that will set our hearts and thoughts aright to see how glorious and generous and how wonderful and magnificent that you are, that you have given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, and that you have given us your Son, and in him we have redemption, and that in him we have reconciliation and eternal life. We have joy and satisfaction, things that this world can never give us. So Lord, I pray that you would enable us and empower us through the gospel to really live out the verse 8 qualifications, characteristics, virtues, and that we would be able to live out verse 15 and be ready with an answer to give the world out there a reason, a defense for the hope that we have within us. Lord, we pray that you would do this, and we pray this confidently in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.